great. So I'm going to change uh, maybe a little directions a little bit here. I'm going to talk about experiences from the Emerge Network, which you uh, heard from Terry about and Mark, and uh, also talk about some experiences at Vanderbilt, really talking about getting these kinds of data out of the medical record and how I think we can get um, high-quality phenotypes. This shows a map of the Emerge Network, um, the 10 sites that are uh, currently in it. And the goals of the Emerge Network when it was founded in 2007 um, with five sites at that time were, were uh, to, to use EMR-derived data to uh, identify high-quality phenotypes that were validated and then to perform GWAS on them. And each site um, did uh, three to 4,000 patients um, for a particular phenotype. And then we started realizing that we could pool these data across different sites and deploy phenotype algorithms across these sites to collectively explore new phenotypes. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those in particular. Um, and then we have uh, moved on to actually uh, implement genetic data into EHRs for um, genomic medicine. We have both pediatric and adult sites involved. And so there's a process of defining a phenotype. I really want to emphasize that we're trying to use the whole electronic medical record to do this, not just using billing codes and things like that. So we start with the phenotype of interest, work with local experts uh, clinically, and define an algorithm that will um, get at uh, uh, what we think will define a case and a control. Both really need algorithms. So, you know, you want, you'd want maybe target drug exposures without um, uh, adverse reactions for controls in this case. And then you evaluate that algorithm. So you have uh, physician experts look at the cases using the EHR and decide whether their cases are controls and assess it. And if the precision or positive predictive value is not sufficiently good, revise your algorithm, review another set of random cases or controls until you can get it right. Now, this is the model we usually use for common phenotypes, which is most of what we've done in eMERGE. Um, but we've also looked at some rare ones. And with, with rare phenotypes, you may not want to get a positive predictive value that's perfect because you don't want to throw any cases. But you can still look at multiple classes of information to make your review set um, uh, uh, valid. And so so once in eMERGE, once we get that precision good enough, we deploy it at a given site, we would validate it at a few other sites, then deploy it across the entire network, get our um, cases and controls, combine it with our extant genetic data, and do our GWAS. And so that part can actually happen pretty quickly once you figure out who you're looking for. Our general rule is uh, kind of four elements to combine. So billing codes, IC9s, and CPT end up being um, uh, kind of the floor, uh, necessary but not sufficient to define a phenotype. Uh, as we've all heard, they're imperfect, but they're useful. Um, on top of that, we layer things like uh, notes, uh, data that from um, pathology notes or clinical notes, dermatology notes, you can specify things like that. We do natural language processing on them to identify people that, you know, had a disease versus didn't have the disease, identify the difference between family medical history and the, and the, um, and the patient history, and we can do that with pretty good validity. Um, and then uh, looking at medication data and exposures becomes important. Um, we've talked about using things like location, like burn units, stuff like that. You can do that as well. Um, and, uh, and then looking at labs and test results becomes important. And then you combine these classes of data in, in certain ways, um, usually using Boolean logic, but you can also use more uh, sophisticated methods like machine learning um, and uh, regression models, um, score algorithms, things like that to define your true cases. This just shows one example. We did rheumatoid arthritis um, early on at Vanderbilt, and uh, there were about 10,000 people. We had genetic data at the time. And I just want to emphasize that we have a group of people that the algorithm really worked for, a group of people that we really knew her controls, and then people in the middle. So then people in the middle, you can, you know, review the ones that you think are interesting, you throw away the ones that don't have enough information to be either a case or a control, and then you do your analysis. And we looked at five different diseases in this process and 21 uh, SNPs that had been uh, reproducibly associated with these diseases. The red represents the um, published odds ratios at the time, and the blue diamonds represent what we found in our study. We're underpowered for most of these analyses. We're actually only adequately powered for, uh, ended up at the end of the day with one analysis, but we replicated um, uh, eight to nine of these depending on which genetic model you used. So uh, importantly, they're on the right side of the, um, you know, odds ratio equals one line. We feel like this represents that we can replicate known things using the EHR. 
And now I'm going to tell you about another story from Emerge. Um, so uh, after we had each done our individual um, GWAS studies, and you can see the phenotypes there, dementia, cataracts, peripheral arterial disease, diabetes, and um, normal cardiac conduction, we pulled that data and said, let's investigate a new phenotype and reuse this data. And so that phenotype was autoimmune hypothyroidism. We developed an algorithm at one site, deployed it at the other sites. The algorithm performed well. It, it, um, uh, really well at four of the five sites and okay at another site. Um, and, then, um, uh, and then we did the GWAS, and we discovered a, a, a thyroid transcription factor, FOXY1, that was associated with autoimmune hypothyroidism. Um, and uh, this was replicated in another population, and uh, subsequent GWASs have found the same result. So this is what that algorithm looks like, just to show you what one of these looks like. So we have medications, we have billing codes, we have lab values. Um, we exclude certain things, secondary causes of hypothyroidism. We looked at timing, so it had to be without a window of pregnancy um, and uh, 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 contrast exposure, and put all the stuff together to get our algorithm. And this summarizes um, uh, really different phenotypes we've done across eMERGE and Vanderbilt. The ones in bold uh, represent ones that had significant GWAS results um, or significant in Canada, that small group of candidate gene uh, pharmacogenetic studies I mentioned at the bottom there. Um, and many of these also found new findings. Um, and overall, there's more than 40 phenotypes we've looked at. We've also contributed to a lot of large studies. Um, I want to highlight a few that deal with more rare events, um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, drug-induced liver injury, and warfarin-related bleeding events. For these, we developed algorithms where we actually uh, didn't get perfect positive predictive values. We had to go in and do some manual curation of the data, but um, we were able to get things that worked in cases that we were happy with at the end of the day. So both pharmacogenetic and um, disease phenotypes have worked. These show two results from two of these GWASs that have significant results. Uh, with ACE cough, um, we uh, did simply uh, uh, natural language processing of allergies in clinical notes. So um, doctors reporting that people had cough on ACE inhibitors. We looked at all the different ACE inhibitors and that sort of thing. And that was an automated analysis. And we had lots of cases in the controls. And heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, it was a a tougher phenotype to do, so we looked at lab results, we looked at um, NLP, um, and, uh, and then we uh, manually adjudicated um, uh, the possible records to identify a true case in the controls and found a signal there too, and both of these were replicated. So if you look at all the phenotypes we've done so far and collected in a website that we call VKB, you can see um, the, the performance of these here. The positive predictive value is generally really good. You see the median in red there, but you know there's some, there's some that are lower. And I mentioned this before, drug-induced liver injury happens rare enough that you don't want to throw away any possible cases. So this shows these results. And then you look at that 30% PPV, you have to review, you know, three cases for every one real case instead of, you know, 100. Um, so looking at SGSTEN, we've done some preliminary work. Um, it was alluded to earlier that uh, the IC9 code system has, was revised in 2008 to specify specific types um, at, for SGS and TEN. Before that, you just have a, 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 a you know, meta class of erythema multiforme that would have been used. And in our analysis, we also looked at keywords for SGS and TEN and misspellings. And um, after review, and I tried to look, find the denominator of this. I don't actually have the denominator, but um, we reviewed several hundred cases. And uh, at the end of the day, we felt like um, uh, uh, 72 um, were people that the physicians really thought had SJS, TEN, um, REM. And uh, 17 of those were treated at Vanderbilt in our burn units. Um, and nine were actually marked as EM as opposed to SJS, TEN. 17 um, were, um, had, had good descriptions of the case, but weren't actually treated at Vanderbilt. So you could think, you know, how much do you uh, want to go with those? And then there were 38 that had more um, fleeting mentions that you could tell the physicians, you know, believe they had the diagnosis, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's unclear whether or not, um, uh, you know, you can't go back to the biopsy results and that sort of thing. 35 of these 72 had a drug identified with 20 different uh, drugs, sometimes multiple drugs uh, considered as possibilities. The biggest I saw was um, in one patient was three um, mentioned as possible, and they're all ones that you would expect. Um, the um, uh, so a lot of times we have path reports but not universally present. Um, uh, an interesting problem is they're in PDFs uh, for dermat 
derm uh, pathology reports sometimes. So we'd have to, in our system, that requires extra effort to go get. And uh, in recent years, um, uh, pictures um, are, are there for a lot of the patients as well. So it would provide another form of evidence you could use. Um, those would also require a special uh, practice to get into our system. Of note, at Vanderbilt, our systems now, um, we have about uh, twice as many patients with DNA. So we could you know, expect to find more cases than this if we repeated it. Um, this is a study pr uh, data provided by Bob Davis, um, and so I, I've summarized it here, looking at ICD-9 codes and their accuracy across the, H the, the HMO research network um, in about 8 million patients. Um, they found about 50,000 people with one of these groups of ICD-9 codes. So if you look at the old ICD-9 codes um, uh, you, before 2008, you can see the positive predictive value there isn't very good unless you're hospitalized for more than 14 days. Um, and if you're hospitalized there, you had a 77% uh, PPV. And then if you look at the specific codes, if you get hospitalized, you know, three days or more, you're looking at a, a PPV that's uh, 57 to 92%. Um, you can see the number of cases over there. And then those nonspecific rash codes outside of the, you know, erythema multiforme code or its um, siblings in the IC9 code system really didn't work very well at all. Um, and across the whole network, they estimate that you'd have between 1,000 to 2,500 cases out of that 8 million. Interestingly, that ends up being about the same incident rate, a pretty similar incident rate to what we found at Vanderbilt, about uh, 3 to 5 per 10,000. And of course, these represent referral centers, so you'd expect over-representation at these centers. Um, so uh, another example to talk through is dress. So, you know, searching the EMR for dress is not very useful, um, as we can all imagine. And it's also under-recognized by physicians. So, um, but, you know, we can go at this other way. So we could look at the drug exposures that we're interested in. We can look at presence of a rash, eosinophilia, you know, other laboratory abnormalities. We can look for fevers, because well, most of us have vital signs. Um, we could look for lymphadenopathy and uh, uh, physical exam sections. Um, and we can, of course, look for uh, target uh, end organ damage um, as well and um, model that and validate it. So, so I think you could do sort of, you can go at things like this, develop more complicated models to find cases. And we haven't done dress, but I, I, you know, I think we, we could um, with time and input. So some strengths, it's rich, rich and longitudinal. It's collect, collected prospectively. So you have the potential to find you know, fatal diseases um, uh, as they accrue in a population. Um, the, uh, uh, it's, it's where you're actually doing the discovery as well. So you have the possibility for this closed loop process. Um, and you get all the expensive testing that would be done essentially for free in the EMR. But you also don't get it on everyone um, like you may desire. So developing algorithms takes time is a challenge. Um, you definitely need local expertise. The phenotypes are rare, and the drug exposure is important. Um, so you want lots of people. Um, the key data is often in PDFs, um, at least at our site, which requires special work to get and is not an all-research repository. Um, I mentioned the causative drugs can be hard to find. I think we found that, you know, other data presented, I think Munir presented it earlier. Um, uh, I may have that wrong. Um, we found that here, too. Treatment's obviously uh, variable at our sites, and um, we have to do special things to worry about uh, getting uh, names. Eponyms can be suppressed in our system, and that's true for other research repositories as well. After we were to find these com uh, situations, we could look at comorbid disease. We could follow for mortality and other outcomes and evaluate for um, treatments um, and then find controls, uh, I think, would be a strength because we do have very large populations. Um, I uh, uh, wanted to uh, discuss, this is switching directions a little bit, but a discussion came up about sort of commonality of um, and how you would go about testing. And, and so, so we've looked at exposures to pharmacogenetic medications outside of SJSTEN, and I went and just modeled that in SJSTEN. So this is what we found um, in 50,000 patients that uh, sort of get routine care at Vanderbilt and looked at for one of the 57 medications at the time that was on the FDA list of pharmacogenetic medications. And you can see that the key thing here is the, the, the top left. And you can see that, you know, if, if you get a, a, overall about 65% of people get at least one medication in five years of those 57 as a pharmacogenic story. But, you know, you, you see about half that number um, also are getting two. And, you know, about 16% actually get four um, medications in five years. And you can see, so, so if you get one, you're more likely to get another. And, and, and so if you can think about if you actually genotype for these people um, and get the full HLA type, you could reuse it. When I looked at Vanderbilt data for patients that had at least three-year contact that were adults, um, and I looked at these, these um, uh, I think it was five medicines, yes, I looked at allopurinol, 
um, lamotrigine, phenytoin, carbamazepine, and bacavir. So all ones with, that have you know, certain HLA types identified in 98,000 patients, 12% um, of this population took at least one of these medications. Um, now, we didn't see as many uh, occurrences of having one uh, medicine getting a second medicine, but in this case, 6% um, took it greater than one medication of these, um, of these uh, five medications. And interestingly, you know, if you think about that, if, if, we have, if we were able to implement a Bacavir, I'm sorry, if we were able to implement Bactrim um, as, a, as a target, you know, Virtually all of these patients are either allergic to or exposed to um, that medication. I feel like uh, in our EMR. So, so you know, if we if we discover more, there's a rich population for which we could apply it if we had full HLA typing. I think. Um, so in, in Emerge, we have a total, and there's other sites that have EMR linked data, Kaiser, the Million Veterans Program. We have international groups like UK Biobank, at uh, Biobank, and uh, at Recon. And just in the U.S. programs, we have, you know, greater than a million people um, available um, within these resources that have DNA uh, linked to electronic medical records um, with, uh, uh, you know, 350,000 or more that have existing um, GWAS data and uh, routinely do these studies um, and emerge. Um, so I think that, you know, these would provide a platform you know, that we would need of this kind of size to do these kinds of studies, um, though it is not trivial and you would have to get full access to the records to go and do it. I think we've shown that, yeah, I think you can do these kinds of investigations. So that's all I had. Yeah, that was great, Josh. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, one is just uh, related to the FDA talk um, previously. Uh, HMORN, which you demonstrated, is actually part of Sentinel. So it seems like an uh, opportunity uh, to uh, maybe in the prioritization within Sentinel, since we have something that seems to work reasonably well in the HMORN uh, data warehouse, uh, to maybe put that forward as a, as a project. Um, the uh, questions that I have about the phenotyping, you didn't mention anything uh, about ophthalmology. Um, it may be because we know that ophthalmology notes are way worse than dermatology pathology reports uh, because of their tendency to draw pictures in that, which are really hard to parse uh, with NLP. Uh, but it strikes me that as we think about the longitudinal nature of the data, uh, that we may be able to look at encounters uh, with different specialists that are involved in the sequelae of Stevens-Johnson 10s to maybe derive a, uh, a pattern of consultation that might be informative in terms of identifying individuals. So it may not be so much what did the ophthalmologist say in the note, but if the person has recurring uh, visits uh, to the ophthalmologist, particularly related to corneal abnormalities, that that might be a trigger. Have you looked at that? So, uh, you know, in, in Emerge, we have looked at a couple different ophthalmology phenotypes and I uh, feel like we can actually do fairly well with those even if we can't actually get the ophthalmology notes um, because they uh, can be scribbled, handwritten documents that um, can be hard to read. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the sites actually went through and did um, optical character recognition on top of um, the handwritten notes and were able to identify some um, interesting metrics. Um, that is not universally easy to do. Um, but uh, uh, the diagnoses you get by saying, okay, they're seeing an ophthalmologist, you're using the billing code by the ophthalmologist, it's happening multiple times, that actually works really well. And clearly by the time they have a, a procedure that's specific for a certain diagnosis, that also works very well. So, so I think, you know, even in that realm, I, I think we found that you can uh, find uh, opto data and, and get data, get, get meaningful um, information out of it. Howard. You know, one of the things that, that Andrea mentioned uh, was the, the side effects or, or adverse events that happen six months down the road. Or other, um, how, how does your system handle some of these temporal, maybe temporally distant uh, phenotypes? Because I, you know, as she was describing that, it resonated, but I figured, you know, no one's really looking at it because often they're not at our center anymore. Yeah, I think that's actually a real strength in, in these cohorts because we could go, you know, we can find when they had uh, SGS TEN and then look forward for different outcomes and see when they develop, um, you know, and, and since a lot of them are prospective since, you know, the 2000s, um, even for patients who ended up dying from SGS or TEN, you know, a year or two later from some complication, you could, you could go back and I think, I think you could get that kind of data. Um, 
all these resources have timestamp data um, that you could go and mine, and a lot of our algorithms do look at that. A lot of the pharmacogenetic algorithms I showed you include things like an exposure, an outcome, a second outcome, all temporally sequenced. Um, and we do pretty well with that kind of stuff, but it just takes input of time to go in and, and mine and build. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an important outcome that I think is worth, um, you could be worth diving into. Yeah, I wondered, Josh, when, if, if a good number of your patients are actually referred to you from other hospitals, how well are you able to follow them within your system once you discharge them? So, so that would be the key problem with that. Thanks for mentioning that. So um, some systems are going to have better capture that than others, clearly, um, because it, it, it's more of a network. And, and that might be one of the strengths of like the HMORN if they went deeper. Um, at Vanderbilt, we have a quite a bit of fragmentation. And so uh, they may follow up for specific subspecialties, um, but may not have as comprehensive a collection at our institution as you may get um, at uh, Geisinger, for instance. Um, it's interesting if you look at the one hypothyroidism, the one outlier was people that were sort of didn't have as much, didn't have as comprehensive care at one site as sort of the other sites tended to have um, in their population, and that led to lower positive predictive value. So it used to be a strength that like the HMO Research Network had very good follow up, but it turns out when we did a study to look at that. Um, we have about 90 percent uh, has about 90 percent follow up after one year, um, and it actually goes down by about 10 percent every year. And, and I mean, it seems to get asymptotic at around that point. But at five years, you really only have about 50 to 60 percent of the people still under observation, um, and it's actually remarkably under unswayed or uh, uh, not really altered by whether or not they have comorbidities. You would think that the sicker people would stay in the system, but it's just the nature of the healthcare system these days. It seems like people are just you know moving around. Yeah, I wonder, Bob, if you might take a minute for our, our international visitors and just describe very briefly what the HMO Research Network is. Uh, the HMO even, even what an HMO is? <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So the HMO Research Network is a, a, com a conglomeration of, uh, a, of a research-oriented uh, health maintenance organizations that, uh, um, in essence, for lack of a better word, sort of uh, agree to uh, share standardized uh, data in collaborative scientific projects um, with a combined population, sort of depending on who participates of you know, somewhere between 13 and 16 million people, I think, uh, at any given time. And, and they've spent a lot of time developing common data models so that uh, things like what Josh showed in the eMERGE data set where you could um, sort of come up with a standardized algorithm to identify people, say, with stroke or Stevens-Johnson syndrome or heart attacks or various other conditions can be um, assessed and used for various uh, uh, epidemiologic uh, and health services studies. The one thing I'll add to that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when you look at this phenotype, it's going to break any common data model because the amount of data you have to go in and get each site, you know, uh, I think even from one epic installation to another epic installation, you're going to have to have some local expertise because I, th I think this is the kind of phenotype you have to dig deep. Um, like we found with drug-induced liver injury, we found some of these other, you know, thornier, temporal-related uh, complex drug exposure kind of things. I think you, you're going to have to do some digging, but um, but I think that we, I think it's very doable. I think it's doable with accuracy. Okay, if there are no further questions, we, we can go on then to our, our third speaker in this session, uh, who is Dr. Wimon. Um, sorry, it's a long name. Uh, <laughs> so, Wimon Suwon Kesawang. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you should introduce yourself. <laughs> no, I won't, I won't make you do that, but uh, at any rate. Um, and uh, Wimon, Wimon comes to us from, um, the, she's the head of the Health Product Vigilance Center at the uh, Thai Food and Drug Administration. Uh,